back for another episode of the Phoenix Film Revival Podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Yannacone, and I have my lovely co-host with me, Stacy. Hi. She's also my wife. <laughs> <laughs> it's <a> true story. <laughs> and co-owner of Phoenix Film Revival and runner. She does all the stuff. I do some of the stuff. Dan <laughs> does some of the stuff as well. In between us, we do all the stuff. <laughs> I'm just I'm just the producer. Well, the podcast, maybe. Yeah, so people may have noticed I've sort of taken over on the podcast, but yep. Dan has discovered he's better behind the scenes than he is <laughs> on the microphone. I just introduced the show. <laughs> which happens, which happens, which is fine. And then I've sort of, sort of took the, you know, a lot more of the speaking role, which is yep. fine if you guys don't mind listening to my nasally voice. But. She's our podcast spokesperson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm a podcaster. <laughs> yes. So, But hopefully we're, we're, you guys that are listening to us, you know, aren't too annoyed by us and... I hope you're enjoying the content that we're putting out here with all the yeah. photographers. And I know I've been enjoying it. I've been enjoying getting to know people. And I was telling you earlier, like learning about these photographers. And so now we're sort of going down the, yeah. you know, the route of learning about these, you know, people that made photography, you know, in the beginning, like it made it possible for the rest of us. So it's been really fun digging yeah. in and finding information. Cause I've heard like tidbits of things here and there, but to really do some deep diving it's been super duper fun. So, and I think the fun thing about it is it's all connected, and oh my God, that's what yeah. Stacy's finding now with her research is that everybody knows everybody, and um, you know, there's mm-hmm. there's connections all throughout, and um, it's just kind of you know trails you off into learning this other thing that that happened in the past, and uh, yeah, yeah, everything builds off of everything else. People are inspired by other people. So I think you'll you'll be able to, you know, easily see all the connections sort of come together as we talk about people and other photographers down the road. Even not modern photographers, everybody, you know, has those people that inspire them when they shoot and they think about like, oh yeah, or a process that maybe they think about and want to get into. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about this yesterday. We had a workshop and, you know, we mentioned in the workshop to folks. And that was their our intro to film workshop. And a lot of people coming into that workshop, you know, they vary a little bit. Some people are really good with digital, but they've never touched film. Or there's people that have touched film, but, you know, wasn't since high school. Um, so you get kind of a varied a group in there. But the folks we try to explain, you know, film's not just film. I think a lot of people don't realize how many actual, you know, alternative processes and traditional processes actually exist out there. Right. Um, and it's kind of interesting. We were looking at the, I, I decided to put the list together and I think the list was like over 150 processes that like some, you know, a little more used than others, but there's like about 150 or so processes for making a photo, which yeah. is kind of crazy. When you think about it. Um, the guy that we're going to talk about today is sort of like the next logical step. Cause the last podcast that we had, we talked about um, the piece. So Joseph Nesifor. Um, we talked about him and he was the first guy that actually like managed to capture a photo, but now we're going to move into, um, Daguerre. Yes. So it's a Daguerre. good, yeah, Daguerre, Daguerre and Daguerre. Um, he's the guy that basically got the whole thing. So in a piece, you know, people, not everybody knew about a piece, but everybody knew about Daguerre. Daguerre became worldwide known. The process was named after him. <laughs> they yep. Named it after himself, the daguerreotype, which is fine. He didn't invent it. He can do that. And actually it sounds pretty cool. Um, but he's the guy that really started it for everybody. And at this point, you know, prior to this, there was people working on photographies for sure. And they were working on processes to actually capture. But it wasn't until Daguerre where it became like a worldwide phenomenon. <laughs> so yeah. he's super important in that way. Um um, if you were listening to our last podcast, um, hopefully you did, but if you weren't, um, he teamed up with um, Napis. So Napis was the guy that finally captured an image. He finally got one. Um, later on, he partnered up with Daguerre. 
Now, they weren't friends, but they were business partners, the two of them. Um, Daguerre was a business guy. He was like hype man. He was the guy that could get information and get it out there. And Napisse was really a tinkerer. He was just a guy that was in his lab doing his thing, trying to figure stuff out. So it was a good pairing between the two of them. But tragically, um, not too long after their partnership, probably about four years, I think it was, Napisse died. So I mean, Daguerre was left on his own to go ahead and, you know, figure all this stuff out. But he had a good start. He had a good base layer. Um, and when we talked about Napisse, a lot of what we talked about is, you know, the first kind of form of photography where you weren't actually capturing that image, where you had the camera obscura, where you had the box and you had, you know, the image come in. And a lot of the time people would have like, you know, linen or some sort of other fabric inside the box. They could actually be inside of it and they could do tracings and paintings right directly onto the image that was coming in from the outside, you know, and they were capturing that. Right. So Jacques was in that same vein where Jacques understood the the concept of, um, you know, these camera obscuras. And the one thing he really, really truly understood was light. That was like his big thing. So what he was, it was a combination of kind of the perfect storm of things you need to be to be like, you know, someone that would actually get photography to where it was. So he was French, the gear, obviously. Um, he was a, an artist and he did scene painting and he did theater design for the opera. He was also a physicist and he manufactured mirrors, which was hmm. definitely an important part of this. Um, also, he painted these panoramics. Um, what he actually was super well known for before the daguerreotype came about um, was the diorama theater. Um, diorama, you think diorama, now you think like a little tiny scene in a box, which isn't too far off. That's what it is. But back in the day, a diorama theater would be um, sort of the precursor to cinema. There wasn't cinema. There was just like live plays, things like that. But you couldn't have anything that was somewhat repeatable um, that people could see. So they had these diorama theaters. Um, they were super popular. Kind of, They came about in Paris. So this was like early 1800s that they came about. And basically it would be a landscape paintings that were in this gigantic room. And they're beautifully done landscapes. I mean, he was a hell of an artist. Like um, just beautiful, beautiful work. It was like super fine art landscape stuff. Like with buildings and, you know, outside views, things like that. And they would have these paintings inside this building and they would have it basically set up similar to a cameo, camera obscura, but the image was inside the room on the paintings and on like linens and other fabrics that were sort of see-through and they'd be layered upon layered and they would have a lot of lighting coming in from skylights that were positioned in just the right way within the room. So the light from the day would come into the room and be focused on certain parts of the painting. And it would make the whole thing, because the way all these lights were positioned, it'd make the whole scene come alive. Hmm. So you would have clouds passing by in the day and it would make like stuff flicker within the picture. So you could stand in there and watch these photos, or not photos, but these um, paintings, and they literally looked like you were there. And they were like alive because they had actual light coming into the room. Um, and he was just really good at refining that. Um, but that would have been cool to go into those. I don't think any oh, yeah, of them, absolutely. them survive. Um, you would, <laughs> the, the original ones, you would stand there looking at this massive like landscape photo with the, the lights and stuff. And, you know, if you were there at the beginning of the day versus the end of the day, like it would look completely different depending on the light. You could watch these images go from like day to night. Um, it was really crazy. But then you'd be standing as a participant. And we're talking... Close to 400 people would go into these rooms hmm. and they would be on this rotating stage, basically, and they would rotate themselves. They would rotate the audience to face the next painting. You would think it'd be easier to do it the other way around where you rotate the paintings, but that wouldn't work because of the way that they had the skylights in the room. So you had to rotate the audience. <laughs> you couldn't rotate the painting because <laughs> they depended on a very specific point in the room right. where these skylights were. So they would actually go ahead and. They would rotate them and then people would look at the paintings on this, um, you know, semi-transparent linen. It had to be because of the light that would go through it. Um, it but sounds really interactive. It was. Yeah. And like I said, it was it really was like, you know, a cinema in a way. Yeah. There wasn't, you know, you didn't go to see the movies for sure. <laughs> it wasn't a thing. Yeah. Um, so it was kind of a great thing. And it was something that really captivated a lot of people back then. So he had that going on. 
Um, but he was really fascinated with light and capturing images. And like that was sort of in that same vein, you know, he was capturing like, hey, this is a scene, you know, of what it looks like. Um, he had some interesting ones. He has uh, the only one really that I could find that's surviving that you can still actually see that he did. Um, there's a church and it's in uh, Brie. Uh, the town is named Bryn sur Marne. I always screw up the pronunciation of everything. So everyone forgive me. There's not as many French words as we did last time. <laughs> so I, won't, <laughs> <laughs> I won't butcher as much. <laughs> and Daguerre is like so much easier than Napisa's name for some reason. <laughs> um, but Bryn sur Marne, which is B-R-Y-C-S-U-R-M-A-R. N E. So if anyone knows how to say that properly, go ahead. <laughs> you don't have to correct me. It's okay. <laughs> but anyway, it was outside of Paris. So there was a church outside Paris. Um, and in the Paris, it's a very, very modest church. It's not like a cathedral by any means. It's a very, very super modest church. And at the back of the altar, behind the altar, there's basically an 18 by 20 foot painting that's back there. And the painting itself makes it look like there's a giant cathedral that's behind them. So behind the altar, so you're in a modest church, but when you walk in and look at this painting, you see like this very long cathedral behind the altar area. Um, and it's super well done, super well painted. Mm. Um, they restored it, I think it was in the 90s, they restored it to get it better. But um, it, that's the same thing where it's like basically this hall and the way that they line things up. And they said that even when you go in there, like the candles, there's like candelabras that have like half metal wax on the picture. And it looks like the candles are flickering because of the way the light comes into the room. Um, so that'd be really cool to see that in person. I'd love yeah, to absolutely. see that. But yeah, he would just, he would do crazy things with light where he had like these screens and shutters and skylights. If you go online and look up that church, um, the church of Brie, B R I E. You can actually watch some videos showing it from day to night and like how crazy the difference is in there. But um, very cool. Very, very, very cool. Awesome. Yeah. So he's, you know, doing this. He's understanding light, wanting to capture an image, just like a lot of people in the day were. There was quite a few people, I'm sure, that were working on stuff like this. Um, he got together with Napice. He, I was, we were talking on the, the previous podcast, they had a optics guy in common. <laughs> so optics were a thing. They had telescopes, they had microscopes, like people had glass optics back then. And the guy that was the optics guy knew both of them and basically introduced them. And that's how they started conversing. And they started email, not email. <laughs> <laughs> they started writing their each other email. <laughs> with an <laughs> old fashioned way, <laughs> not email. Yes, their version of email. That'd be hilarious. Um, they started, you know, talking together and kind of working stuff out. But like I said, he died. Napis died. So Daguerre had to do it all by himself. So after Napis had died, which was, I think, 1833, he had died. Um, about two years later, after that, um, after doing some tinkering, tinkering, Daguerre had a breakthrough. He finally got something where he was like, oh, this is more than what we had before. So previously with Napis, they managed to get images, but it took about eight hours. And it wasn't great. They didn't look super good i mean they yeah. you could tell what they were sort of um but they weren't perfect and it took eight hours <laughs> to get the image so it wasn't great so this is how he had his breakthrough which is kind of amazing how these things kind of sometimes happen right so he was taking a photo from his studio and he was doing it of a still life um and he had actually set up you know by the light by the window but he also to get maximum light because he knew he needed tons of light for this especially the process that he was using them he had he used mirrors he even put some mirrors up to like maximize the amount of light that was shining onto his still life um and he knew at that time or at least he thought this would take about eight hours because that's what he was at like that's the timeline that they were at at that point um, so he would have a, you know, basic camera, which is basically just a box with a lens and a space in the back where you could put, you know, the plate back there. So before they put the plate in, it would be ground glass, similar to like, you know, your large format cameras of today. And he would use that as a viewfinder, line it all up. Um, he'd take the ground glass out and then his plate that he had, that he had his emulsion on, um, he would take it out of his cabinet, put it in the camera. And then he'd take off the lens cover, let it expose for eight hours, right? 
So this one was exposed for about eh, an hour, give or take. And then the clouds came. <laughs> so yeah. he looked at it and he saw the clouds. And apparently it was one of those days where you're like, this isn't getting better. This is just going to be cloudy all day long. So this is a waste of my time because you needed insane sun just for an eight hour. So he's like, right. he gave up. He's like, this isn't going to work. I'm going to do this tomorrow. Took the plate out and he put it into his chemical cabinet. All right. So he put it in the chemical cabinet, shut it up. He came back the next day to go and reuse the plate and start again because it was sunny out. And he pulled the plate out and lo and behold, he had a developed image on the plate. That's cool. And he's like, what? I can't even imagine. <laughs> I'm imagining like, you know, there's no one there with it, like recording that saying what happened exactly. Like this is him telling people what happened. Yeah. Um, but the look on his face was probably kind of amazing. <laughs> I would bet, yeah. <laughs> All of a sudden, you you accidentally created photography. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it existed, but he created, like, he was like, that image was not exposed very long. Like, it was under an hour. It was, you know, a very short exposure. So, he's like, and he had, a, like, a developed image. He had an actual image there. And he's like, what in the world happened? Right. So, it came to be that it was the mercury vapor in his chemical closet that actually caused it to happen. Um, I've heard, and no one's real clear, someone said it was a broken thermometer that he had in there that exposed the mercury. But I suspect he may have had just an open bottle of mercury in it because he had like all kinds of chemicals. But Yeah, I don't a, know about the thermometer. I don't think so either. That sounds made up. It does sound made up, doesn't it? But I think he just had mercury in there and the vapors were enough to, you know, overnight to actually make it happen so it was kind of by accident that he discovered mercury vapor was the way to go um my guess is you know all his other chemicals were maybe closed up in there and that one was the open one so that was like the first one where he's like hey maybe i should follow this one a little bit, a little bit. Yeah. um you know just a little trial and error on that um so i can give you the process so yeah this, I'm is, curious, this, this like, is what he did how does the photo work yeah and granted he was doing lots of experimenting you know, here and there and changing up the process as it went. But this is kind of the basic process of what he did. So he would have a copper plate that was silver coated. Okay. And he would clean it and polish it to look like a mirror, just like a mirror, like shiny, shiny look in it. You can see your reflection back to do main mirrors. You know what he was doing. He could buff this stuff out. So the mirror was basically face down above iodine and bromine. And that would sensitize the plate. So the vapors of those two things would actually sensitize the plate. Right. And then the sensitized plate would then go into the camera and it would be exposed, give or take five to 60 seconds. It depended a lot about like, you know, what kind of light it was, how strong the light was that was on it. At um, that, that point, it would take, him out of, take it out of the camera and there'd be an invisible image, which, you know, latent image. I think we talked right. about this in some previous podcasts. You know, you have, it's it's there. It just hasn't been developed yet. It hasn't come out yet, but it's, right. it's effects. Same thing with film today. You have a latent image. It doesn't come out until you actually put it in the developer. Um, so the plate was then um, developed using mercury, but you used mercury vapor that was actually heated. So you had Sounds to heat it up. dangerous. Yeah. See, that's, <laughs> that's the part that's a little scary. So if you know anything about mercury... <laughs> Um, it was heated up to 167 degrees. That's a very exact number, but that's where he ended up at, where 167 was kind of like the perfect temp to get the vapor um, to develop the plate perfectly. Yeah. Um, and then at that point, it had to be fixed. So you want to make a nice permanent image. You don't want the image to just disappear on you and turn to completely black. Um, so removing the unaffected, so the silver iodine that wasn't affected by light, using heated salt water at the time. That's the first thing that he used. And then down the road, um, and all these things, you know, obviously over time were kind of like worked on. Um, later on, he had a, he went with that sodium theosulfate, which was way more effective. And that's actually a pretty, like we even have a bottle of that in the lab. Sodium theosulfate mm -hmm. instead of the mercury vapor? No, instead of the silver salts or the mm. salt water oh, to salt do water. the fixing. Yeah, the okay. fixing part, which is still used today. Sodium theosulfate is like a, that's an ingredient of fixer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So salt water is similar 
chemically. <laughs> it's not yeah. too far off from that. It's a little more refined. Um, so he got that. It was more effective, though, at that point. So eventually he got this whole process down where he was at a minute exposure, basically, like where you were. You're basically under a minute for getting this. So he went from pretty quickly from an eight hour to under a minute within a few years. He had this and he had it pretty well figured out. So once he kind of had like the basics, he could really start refining it. Um, he even refined it a little further. At one point, he started putting um, gold chloride on the paper or not the paper, the plate. Um, and the gold chloride would be heated up on the plate. Then they'd rinse the plate and then they'd heat the plate again. And that would really, really help on the stability and the contrast on the plate as well. So that was added in as well later on. Interesting. Um, so, yeah, like his early images when he first started, he was like, you know, 13, 15 minutes, three minutes. Like it varied a little bit. You know, the lighting, you can't control that completely. They didn't have light meters either. <laughs> um, right. But he really did get it down to like less than a minute. So it was a, oh, we can capture stuff now. Like, you know, really important. Um, so, you know, just working on the the different um, chemicals and the faster lens was also a thing. So he used a lens and it wasn't super fast. And we talk about lenses now. And maybe you can talk a little bit about this, because I know when I first got into photography, I'm like a fast lens. I'm like, what the hell makes a lens fast? Like it like confusing. Yeah, lenses are um, lenses are interesting. There's so much to them, um, the way they're designed and in function. But um, a fast lens has to do with your ability to get light through. So fast is referring to the to the exposure time. And when you have an f-stop that can go all the way down to 1.4 or let's say a 1.2, that makes it faster than one that's going to go all the way down to 3.5 f-stop. So that's pretty much how that how yeah. that would work. Yeah. So his lens wasn't super fast. Right. It wasn't great. I don't know what the exact f stop was. Probably but like five point six for the f. It was f -stop yeah. It was definitely higher. It was higher. I think even yeah. So it wasn't great. It worked, but it wasn't great. So down the road later on, a guy named um, Petzvalls came around. So this was a guy. He was um, German Hungarian. He was a math guy. Um, he did lenses, and he actually came up with what was called the Petzval portrait lens. So he mathematically calculated the lens to be perfect for photos. Mm -hmm. um, and it was 22 times faster than Daguerre's lens. And it was a 3.6 f-stop lens. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it was quite a bit. So if you can imagine like what his was originally, it wasn't great if it was, you know, 22 times is quite a bit. So it was 160 millimeter focal length at f3.6, which was cool. Um, so Petzvalls also, and this is kind of fun, he had technical advice from Peter Voigtlander. Hmm. So Voigtlander, that company, they did optics. So those are the guys that were doing, you know, stuff like the lenses that you would have like for your, you know, uh, telescopes and microscopes and, yeah. you know, any optics that you needed back in the day. And when these guys met up, they came up with this lens. And this was like 1840-ish. This all kind of happened about the same time that Daguerre was doing his thing and started, announced it and everything. The Voigtlander Photography Company came to be from then. Hmm. And they started making photographic lenses from that point on. So it came from the need to improve, much like anything else in photography. Everybody's trying to improve everything. So, right. like, hey, how can we make this better? How can we make this better? Yeah. And the same thing. So in Voigtlander, which a lot of people are still familiar with today, I don't think they are in business still today. Right? I don't think so. I, I, think I haven't they, seen anything new. Yeah, I think they went out not that well, long ago, though. I think they were around for a very long time. Uh, but you still see their lenses and that name pop up if you're in photography, for sure. Um, but yeah, and then also the Voigtlander company actually came up with the... Um, so up to this point, the cameras were all wood. And they actually came up with the first metal um, Daguerre-type camera, which is pretty cool. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, very cool. And then... I found some interesting, so I was looking, you know, okay, what's the, the what was the process, give or take, because it did change a little bit here and there. Um, and in my researching of that, I found a um, an article, and I want to read a little bit of this because it's kind of fun, that was actually written by Edgar Allan Poe. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Which is amazing. <laughs> um, so Edgar Allan Poe would contribute to Alexander's Weekly Messenger. So that was a magazine and had a lot of information and he would contribute to that. And then the, the January 14th, 
1840 issue, he wrote about the Daguerre and the, pho- the photographs. So I wanted to kind of read like Edgar Allan Poe's words on the daguerreotype because I thought it was kind of neat. Yeah. Um, so a plate of silver upon copper is prepared, presenting a surface for the action of light of the most delicate texture conceivable. A high polish being given to this plate by means of statatic caloric stone called daguerreolite and containing equal parts stetlite I'm probably not saying that right. <laughs> Stetite and carbonate of lime. The fine surface is then iodized by being placed over a vessel containing iodine until it assumes a tint of pale yellow. The plate is then dis- deposited in a camera obscura and the lens of this instrument directed to the object which is required to paint. The action of the light does the rest. The length of time for the requisite of the operation requires, according to the hour of day, the state of weather, the general period being from 10 to 30 minutes, experience alone suggesting the proper moment of removal. When taken out, the plate does not first appear to have a refined definition, definite impression. Some short processes, however, develop in the most miraculous beauty. So that was interesting. Yeah. So a lot people were captivated. This was like people were captivated that this was a thing. Um, Daguerreotypes were amazing. The view, they look gorgeous. They still exist today. People still do the process today. Um, They're beautiful, beautiful works. They're just, they're a little, um, they're soft. They're a little soft. They're heavy. They're on plates. But they're also the actual emulsion on the top where the photo is. They're kind of soft. Um, So you can really, really easily scratch them. So most of the time when you find them nowadays, they're going to be under glass. Um, Makes sense. Not to be confused with tintypes, which we should get into in another podcast. But um, tintypes hold up a little better. And you can have them outside of glass. But daguerreotypes are kind of really important to be under glass just to kind of, you know, keep them safe. Um, But like I said, people do do them today. Um, there's modern ways of doing daguerreotypes, which are slightly different chemical wise. They don't use the mercury um, and the chloride and the um, the bromine, um, mostly because of the mercury. <laughs> so yeah, I'm sure mercury is not great. And I just keep remembering, like, I have flashbacks to being a child playing with my mercury. <laughs> Once I, had a, I had broken a thermometer and I had a little tiny box. <laughs> and I, I was a little kid. I was like. Oh, man, I'm going to say first, second grade. I was pretty small. And I had a little box full of mercury that I used to play with all the time, (laughs) constantly. And I remember at one point I lost it down in the floorboards of the house that we had. But we didn't live in that house very long, so I wasn't like super exposed. I'm just thinking like people live in that house today. Like like they don't know they have mercury in there. It's only like the (laughs) amount of like a thermometer from like, you know, and I'm kind of old. So early 80s. It's been there. (laughs) But it's not very good for your uh, your nervous system, and yeah, your Mercury's immune system, not so good. your kidneys, your liver. There's not much it doesn't kind of screw up on you. My brother actually got a box from in, um, he had a friend who had uh, acquired all this stuff. And there was a, a bottle of mercury vapor in with that box of stuff. And I was looking through all the other stuff. It's all old chemistry stuff. Um but I didn't realize that you use mercury vapor for, for making daguerreotypes. And I yeah. found out afterwards, I was like, well, how does this relate to, to photography? And then I was like, oh, man, I want to use, <laughs> use mercury vapors and make a real daguerreotype. That would be so awesome. Um, yeah. But I think the safety uh, it's so concern it's not, just, it's not just vapors. You're getting vapors from heating it up to almost 200 degrees. <laughs> Yeah. It's like you have to take some serious safety precautions if you are doing it. That would be fun, though. It would be very fun, yes, but you have yeah. to be very careful. And apparently, there you have to be incredibly accurate with the process as well. Yeah, it's there's a there's a very fine line between like getting an image and not getting an image with the whole process. Mm. Um, but there was a guy about the same time that actually came up with his version of the daguerreotype. So it was the the Becquerel um, daguerreotype. The guy was Alexander Becquerel. Was his name? Um, and that's what most modern photographers will use for daguerreotype just because it does take out the, um, the mercury portion of it. Um, it's still not the safest, (laughs) but it's, you know, it's somewhat safer. Um, and then they use actual fumes of elemental iodine and it forms, um, silver iodine. 
um, with the fumes. So mm. that's light sensitive as well. It's so it's less dangerous and it doesn't cost as much as well. The traditional process costs quite a bit, you know, to get the mercury and all those other things. Yeah. Um, but the problem with the newer, safer, cheaper version is that it's 10 times slower than the traditional process. So it's super duper duper slow. I was looking at like, what's the ISO daguerreotype just to like kind of ballpark it. And I think it was something like 0.0005 Jeez. or something like that. <laughs> so <laughs> really, really, really slow. Um, so the newer process you're looking at, you know, with a really, really fast lens and super duper strong light, you're still looking at like a five minute. Um, so if you see some of the more modern daguerreotypes, that's why they can be blurry because they're using the, mm. the the different version, the safer, cheaper version of it. But the traditional one, you know, that can be seconds. You can get them very quick. And that's evidenced by if you look back at all, you know, vintage antique they're types, sharp. they're incredibly sharp. You oh, yeah. know? Um, people didn't have to stay still as long as people think they had to. They were actually quite quick um, with the right lighting. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> so... The image that still exists today and was like sort of the image that put Daguerre on the map. So he had done all this experimenting in his own and he had images in his lab and he's like, oh, <laughs> I got something <laughs> here. <laughs> so the first one that he really took that went out to the world that people got to see that he was like, hey, I have a thing here. I have a, a process. It was the Boulevard de Temple. Um, so this was a street in Paris and the view is from his studio looking out from his studio and he presented this photo and it wasn't the first photo. There was photos for this with, you know, um, in a piece and everything, but it was the first photo to include an image of a human in it, hmm. which is really, really cool. Um, which is kind of funny. Cause you think about it. I wonder if that guy knew that he was a part of the first photo had a human in it. I feel like I he, doubt it. <laughs> I know. I feel like he never knew, but now like, he, he was the first human, which is crazy if you think about how many humans were prior to like oh, yeah. the 1830s. And like this one dude is like, you're first, you're the first one. He didn't even yeah. know, you know, this dude taking a, you know, picture from his studio. But his studio, so that area, that's in Paris. Um, and at the time, that was sort of like the place to be. Like, that's where you would go. Like that had your theaters and your shops and it had the diorama was right there, right next to like where he lived and his studio was, um, you know, cafes, everything. And they actually had a lot of, um, they actually called it the Boulevard to Crime because like crime melodramas were like super popular in the theaters back in the day. <laughs> so it was a really cool place to be. So imagine busy, right? That's like, you know, oh, yeah. people running around all over the place. So about 8 a.m. in the morning, in April of 1838, he took a daguerreotype and he took it out of his window. Um, at the time, and granted, this was, he was still refining his process. It took, that image took about seven minutes um, to actually expose. And then he took two other the same day. He took one midday and then he took another one um, closer to the evening. So there was actually three pretty much of the same exact view that were taken that day. Um, which is pretty cool. The image itself, um, it's about five by six inches. So not huge, okay. but, you know, that's about how big the cameras were. They were kind of like, you know, sort of handheld sized boxes. They weren't gigantic. Um, now, a lot of people have totally looked at this photo like over and over again, trying to kind of make it out. And if you look at it, it's kind of an amazing photo. It's, it's composed actually incredibly well because, you know, you think back then with the photos, you know, it was, the, the image wasn't to get a good photograph. The image was to get a, image caught like that was yeah, the purpose the of that but if you look at that image you can really see someone that had an artistic eye to it when i look at it because you see it and it's like this is nicely composed yeah <laughs> like it really is it's composed really well you can see a lot in the photo um so a lot of people have kind of looked well, at the it the first photograph that's like a person's got to it's got to look good <laughs> it's got to look good it's got to look good but i think it was the first one where he felt like I think he, my guess is that he knew, okay, this is something I'm going to share with people. Um, and I suspect knowing that he wanted to take a photo that looked impressive to do right. that. And this was an impressive photo for sure. Um, and if, if people that have looked at it, you know, they're like the, the first image that you're like, oh, that's a person. You see a guy and he's over by the street and he's kind of like center-ish 
center left. And he has his foot up on something. And people have determined that he was getting his boots cleaned by a cleaner. Um, you can't really tell the boot cleaners there, but because the, they know that's what was happening. That's, you know, they assume there's a person there. But you can very clearly out of the whole photo, the only person you can really make out is the guy getting his boot done. So over seven minutes, it's very realistic to think this guy had his foot up there while someone was working on his boot, which was there, which is pretty cool. Um, some people think like cause the person that was doing the boot work kind of looks like a pump or something like in the photo. It, look, it doesn't right. look like a person. Um, but they later determined by using the second photo that was taken later on in the day to figure out that it was a boot cleaner because then there were some tools of the trade that were kind of visible in the photo. So they right. saw like um, brushes and polishes like containers that look like that. Hmm. And they're like, oh, okay, no, he was definitely getting his um, his boot done, which is cool. Um, but there's some people that have looked at it and they think that they see a child looking out the window. They think that there's like um, two women in a cart that aren't too far away from the man that was standing. Hmm. Um, and then they think there possibly is a horse in there too. There's probably a lot of people. The image of the day, if you could take it with a modern photo, is actually just teeming with people and traffic and, you know, horses and just tons of it. But because it was the seven Im minute image, everything that wasn't standing still disappeared. Um, but the image is very clear otherwise, like the buildings and things. It's kind of fun to look at it. And you always like every time I look at it, I see something different on that thing. Um, on the far right of the photo, you see a building that like obviously had some sort of fire recently because the whole ceiling's gone. Where it's missing the ceiling, but you see the beams. <laughs> you see the wood beams, but you see like it's been opened up, like a big fire had gone through. And fires were super popular back then. People, you know, had indoor lighting with, you know. Flames. Flames and heating and <laughs> all of this fun stuff. Yeah. Um, so fires were not a non not common thing. Um, it was kind of dirty back in the day, too. But the photo is kind of amazing, which is um, really cool. Awesome. Yeah. So that was in April. And um, the date, people say 38, 39, I guess the records weren't super duper great, but it was give or take. It was about that time. So Daguerre at that point, he wanted to show some people his work. So he gathered a whole bunch of people. It was basically some select like um, scientists and artists that he knew that he was friends with in the, back in the day. And in January of 1839, um, he showed them. And he's like, look what I got. <laughs> people were blown away. They were like, what is this? Like, that was like, a, it was a thing. They were like, okay, all right, this is really cool. You got to go out and, you know, he was basically getting their input of what was, you know, what he did and what they thought and what they thought, you know, what should I do next? And it was determined that he needs to really put this out to the world. He really needs to show everybody. So later on that year, in August, actually August 19th of 1839, his process, he explained it to the Academy of Sciences and Arts. Um, apparently, it was standing room only. There was people in the courtyard. Like, people came out for this. They were like, what is this? <laughs> um, yeah, it was the first time, like, people caught, like, you have a permanent image. Like, how crazy is that? Um, and he's like, I can, look, there's a person. <laughs> like, what? Um, so, he had done a demonstration, and he published instructions for the process. But he was also very smart. He was a businessman and he wanted to be careful. He didn't want to give away everything. So right. for that presentation, he basically gave general descriptions of what he was doing. But he described the process and he did go through it kind of step by step. But he he left out some important details so somebody couldn't just go and grab and do exactly what he was doing. Yeah. So he was smart. He was smart about it, which was really good. Um, and then at that point, he was like, OK, what do I do? What do I do? Um, and he was having some financial issues and he's like, I got to price sell this. <laughs> like I got to, you know, make money off of this. So he actually sold his, um, the invention of daguerreotype to the French government and the French government bought it. And in exchange, they gave him a yearly pension. So we mentioned this when we did the pieces, um, he got 6,000 and the pieces son, Isidore got $4,000 a year from it. Isidore wasn't super happy about it though, because he felt like his dad had a lot more to do with <laughs> the process than, um, but you know, honestly, Daguerre is the guy that like, he put in the work, he got his own process. It was different than yeah. the pieces process, but it was, of course, it was built upon somebody else's work, you know, right. like anything else. So. Fortunately, he had the tools to, to help evolve photography that much more. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, but they both got money. So that was cool. Um, so he got his 6,000 francs a year 
Did I say dollars? I think I might have said dollars earlier. But it was 6,000 francs a year, which I think we worked out to be in our today money for US dollars. I think it was close to 50 grand a year. So it wasn't like a lot. It was, you know, yeah, that, it was give or take. But terrible. it was still like, hey, you know, a yearly 50,000 for not having to do anything else. Like, <laughs> to yeah. just be like, hey, this is the process. Not terrible. Continue to evolve what you're learning and grow the process more well that's the thing <laughs> <laughs> he kind of liked the fame of the process he didn't do much after that he what? kind of just like hyped himself up one hit wonder he sort of sort of <laughs> it was sort of what he did yeah he didn't do a lot um which is kind of funny um so the french government they had it and the king of france basically donated the invention to the world and told them this is free for everybody. Um, <laughs> this is where it's kind of funny, and I'd love to know why. I couldn't quite figure out what the reasoning was, but the UK said no. <laughs> They're like, we don't want your free gift. <laughs> the UK said no? <laughs> basically said no. What? They declined it, um, and it was the only country that you actually had to pay licensing fees um, to process and do the process there. Oh, that's kinda, ridiculous. I know. Very strange. So England, there wasn't a big adoption of it there. So if you go back in history and look at a lot of early daguerreotype, England was not a big part of it. You won't see a lot of like hmm. UK um, involvement with that, which is kind of strange. So you had to pay a patent. You had to pay a fee. There was a patent there. So you had to pay a pretty exorbitant fee to actually do that. Um but because this was out and there was other people still obviously working on the process, an important guy in that was British came up, um, William Henry Talbot. Hmm. So when re, he, William Henry Talbot was working on paper and he was the guy that came with the first photo that was not a positive, it was a negative. So that's super important for photography and I think makes sense probably for our next podcast to be about him. Yeah, we'll share about William having the negative opened a lot of things up <laughs> so, oh, I'm sure, yeah. and it was on paper. So now you could start putting, you know, photography in newspapers and things like that. So awesome. I think it's super important. So in a way I, it's probably good that maybe the UK didn't have as much of that because he was really pushing his own process and Just, working on that. So I think that's a good kind of side way to go. I guess we can thank the UK for that. I guess. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm curious. I want to read a little bit more about um, Talbot. I, I've read a little bit about him, but I think it's kind of funny. The UK is like, nah, everybody else can have it. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want your stinking gifts. <laughs> we, don't, we don't need that. It's fine. We're cool. Um, yeah. But yeah, you had to be pretty rich. Um, so Daguerre, you know, he sold his work. He needed the money. He was getting his money in, but he was still really kind of wanted to ride that fame and ride like what it was that he invented and he was trying to make money from it as well from right. whatever source that he could he actually created a bunch of work and sold he didn't sell them he would set he for free he sent a whole bunch of his photos to like pretty much all of the ruling class of europe like anybody that was a king a queen a ruler he sent away daguerreotypes to them. He was really hyping himself up. He was pretty good about that. Um, Jeez. So the the picture the, that he took of the street that was like the famous one with the guy with the boot thing and everything, the Boulevard de Temple, he sent that one actually over to um, the King of Bavaria. So he sent oh, it to the king. Um, and that was actually a triptych. So that was, um, it had that photo. It had the middle of it was a still life photo. And then the um, the other version or the other picture was that same boulevard picture, but the one that was taken later in the day. Hmm. So he got like two versions of the boulevard plus the still life that he had sent to him. Um, and apparently all of this hyping himself up worked and he actually started making quite a bit of money like off of these things and like from other countries and stuff. So that was good. And then also he got um, royalties from the camera itself because his brother was then manufacturing the cameras, the daguerreotype cameras. Hmm. And he got royalties from the licensing basically from his brother in law. So that's kind of cool. Um, so when I was saying there, there's not a lot that really survive <laughs> of his work because he wasn't doing a lot of work, hmm. which is kind of unfortunate. So we didn't have many, um, the, the daguerreotype that the first image of the first person 
they were really not kept in great conditions. Um, it, it, they were passed around and people just didn't take very good care. And these things were kind of sensitive. Mm. Um, it, they, just, they, they were just not being taken very, very, very good care of. Um, so around 1970, give or take, the plate made it over to the um, in Germany, went to the to Munich. It went to the Stadt Museum and. They were like, hey, we should probably fix this up. It looks kind of bad. And if you look at the image that we have today, you'll see it has some scratches and stuff like that. That was because of the the picture that we see today wasn't recorded until a guy in the 30s got their his hands on them and made copies of them in their present state from the 30s. Mm. And by the 30s, it got shook around a bit. And it was like daguerreotype, we were saying, it's kind of sensitive, it has to be stored properly. It just wasn't stored very properly. So it was already starting to get a lot of wear and tear. And if you look at the photo now, like it would have been much more clear at the very beginning. It would have looked beautiful. And the one that you see when you see online, it's scratchy and like it doesn't look like it was handled very well. And it's right. because it wasn't handled very well. Um, so in the 30s, this guy, I forget his name, um, he was like an art historian and he very smartly made very, very nice copies of the pictures and they were still kept by the museum in Munich. And they were like, Hey, let's uh, restore these. <laughs> <laughs> they ruined them. No. <laughs> it's gone. They Are ruined it. Yep. There was restoration that they attempted not very well. <laughs> oh man that's just, a bummer yep they that's just like when that church had the the painting that got redone and it was like <laughs> do you remember that, that there's been so a bad. few cases of like people trying to do their best but the funniest was the lady <laughs> that like the painting she cleaned it and then tried yeah. to paint it back on <laughs> it's like in the movie it became like a real meme for a while but it's like in the movie Mr. Bean where he, yes. throws the, he draws the nose <laughs> on Whistler's yeah. mother. It's ridiculous. Uh, so I was like, oh, my God, no. And they think that it, it, it probably got screwed up because like the processes that they were dealing with for cleaning and fixing things up, they were using chemicals that they thought were safe. But in reality, they weren't really thinking about, oh, what's this actually made of? Yikes. And they screwed it up. Apparently, it. I, it there's no pictures of it, so I think they full on destroyed it. I don't think it's even like that's unfortunate. Saving what they you know fucked up, well, but at least was, we've got a copy of it. Yeah, the guy from the 30s that made the the copies, yay for him because otherwise we wouldn't have a picture of the first human. They like, should just it left it. They should just just let it be. <laughs> they probably should have. They thought they knew what they were doing. I Until guess people know what they're doing down the road. Yeah, but, there's probably a good story. I dug a little bit. I didn't find a lot, but I think if I dug a little further, I might be able to dig out like an old book or an article or something from the 70s. But yeah, I'd like to hear more about like how that went down and like yeah, like the like oh we ruined the first picture of a human. <laughs> oh, that's a bummer. Uh, apparently, it was like blistered up and everything. Like they full on like bubbled it up. Somebody pretty, lost their job. <laughs> pretty pretty bad. And they must have just like went full hog on it too. Like <laughs> even do like a little test area. Like let's just try the corner first. <laughs> <laughs> let's just, just do the whole thing it's fine let's just destroy it so but grateful 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 for that dude that i don't remember his name from the 30s that totally made copies so we have what we have which is still you know because the thing they were you would think people would be like hey maybe this is something we should really protect for history but you know it is what it is which is kind of funny so yeah so he only has about 25 works that you can nowadays that you can directly contribute to him um, he really just enjoyed the notoriety and he really didn't create much of anything else after the invention went out to the world. He like, That's a bummer. he's just like, look what I did. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bummer. He could have done like, oh man, he could have done so much with it, you know, like first photographs from back then. But mm -hmm. then, I mean, you know, somebody's going to destroy it. It eventually so i guess it doesn't matter <laughs> i guess Who so. knows? maybe he did have some other stuff and he, got destroyed. well he he did actually and it wasn't by fault of him so back to the fires this actually comes into the fires he took what was known to be the first image of the moon so um, yeah but the moon the moon so he he would take photos um when he was experimenting and doing all this stuff he took photos. He had quite a bit of photos. He had more than 25. He had like, you know, a lab. He had like a ton of stuff. Right. 
And he was taking pictures through telescopes. And he was like trying to make these really interesting photos. And he actually took what people consider the first image of the moon. Then the fire came. <laughs> no. Yeah. So in March 8th, exact date, March 8th, 1839, his studio burnt down. No. Yep. Oh, so he lost most of the early work. It was all in there. Um, and he lost a lot of the handwritten records as well that he had working up to the process, which was kind of a fan. Uh, you know, shame. Um, when the fire happened, he actually told the fires the firefighters just let the studio burn and save his adjacent house because his house was right next door. Mm -hmm. um, but apparently, out of everything, um, he did save some notebooks. There was pictures. There was documents. There was apparatus for the docu. You know, the daguerreotype. Um, you know, the camera. So mm -hmm. a lot was saved, but a lot of the early work and our notes to the early work were totally f toasted. <laughs> in the that's fire bummer. yeah that's kind of a bummer so that kind of has a little bit to do with the fact that there's only 25 but also because he didn't do a lot after the fact um the fire kind of happened right in, in the meaty time like the time when he was really getting famous and people were knowing who he was yeah. um, which is cool and then um so that was his studio that he had in um in paris but he also had a house in brinson mar marne like i said before so that was the house that he lived in that was actually where that church is hmm. um, okay so there's a house there it's the daguerre house um and it's there um you can take tours of it but i don't think it's like open open tours like you can't just show up and go in um there's a museum that's not too far away from the house apparently that you can organize a tour to actually go into the house because people have done it but i don't think it's like an open you know hey i'm just gonna show up and go in there hmm. um but it is a thing and then if you ever go to the portrait library in the Smithsonian, which we need to make. That's definitely going to happen. A road trip. We might do that um, maybe soon because we were talking yeah. about PA. So next summer. So that might be a good stop off. DC's not too far. Yeah. Um, we could fly in there. I just thought about that. Yeah. <laughs> we could just fly straight to DC and then drive up. Um, but the portrait gallery is there, which... You know, I've seen bits and pieces of what's in there. I haven't been there. I've been to quite a few of the um, museums. I haven't been to the portrait gallery, though. Yeah. Um, but apparently, and if you look online, they have an incredibly large monument for him. Oh, really? Um, outside. Oh, yeah. That's cool. He has a really, really big mon monument, which is cool. Um, and he died of a, um, basically a rupture of a tumor in his carotid artery. They put it, it was named, his death certificate says burst pulse artery tumor. <laughs> so ouch <laughs> his heart went out basically um probably yeah. that mercury is i know up. <laughs> i know you wonder like wonder if any of that had to do with the chemicals so they were dealing with some serious stuff but you know the guys weren't stupid that were using these chemicals i think they knew but at the same time you know they don't have like modern they didn't have latex gloves yeah there wasn't like, like modern safety equipment like we have now um but i think to a certain extent it's good they were aware but yeah people also didn't live you know, super long. I forget how old he was. He was he was younger ish. I think he was sixty seven. That might be close. Um, yeah. So he wasn't like too too bad. Um. Also, which is kind of fun. So daguerreotypes were popular. They were just everywhere. America took full force of this thing. Like America really went kind of crazy. Um. And this photography was up and running at this point because everyone could do it. And it was right. like, okay, this is a thing. Like, we can absolutely do this. Um, about this time, the the actual term photography was created. Um, there was a guy that made that term, Heinrich von Madler. Um, 1839, he came up with the term photography, which um, literally means drawing with light is kind of what it is. So it's like photo, which is light, and graph is draw. Hmm. So you're which makes sense and then photographers and photography and like and photography studios started popping up like crazy um eventually england did start popping up a ton of them as well so yeah. by the 1860s they had them um there was about 42 of them on one street alone <laughs> there were so many Jeez. um and new york had new york city in 1850 so it was earlier because they had free freer range a little faster they had 77 in new york alone that you could go to a photography studio. So people oh, were man. very, very excited about having Could you imagine living back then and like going into these stu like studios? I know. It had been amazing. So amazing. At that point, like you never knew what your past relatives looked like. 
Right. Like, you can never see a photo of like, oh, that's my grandmother. Right. Like you never know, like up to that point, like you had no record of anybody. So at this point now people could get like a permanent record of their likeness and their relatives likeness. Insane. And like, yeah, that had to have been just an amazing, amazing time to like witness that. I mean, I'm still amazed when I see simple 35 millimeter take a photo i'm like this is magic <laughs> it feels a little bit like magic but to like never have seen that prior to that is just like what yeah um it's kind of funny with daguerreotypes though the the how popular they were if you pull a five dollar bill out if anyone has one there in their wallet pull pull one out there um take a look at that picture of abraham lincoln that picture of abraham lincoln was actually based from a daguerreotype that was taken. So Matthew Brady in 1864 took a daguerreotype of Abraham Lincoln, which you can also find that online. And if you take a look at that head, <laughs> that is Lincoln's head on that $5 bill. That's crazy. Yeah, so it's still, so whenever you look at a $5 bill, like, oh, daguerreotype, oh, daguerre. <laughs> like, and you think, oh, that's the beginning of photography. And it really, really took off from then. At this point, it was off and running, processes started coming out left and right, it was really, really the true beginning of photography with Daguerre. So incredibly important work. Um, he's obviously still, his name is yeah. still very, very, very popular. He's actually um, named on the Eiffel Tower. So hmm. I, I wasn't aware of that. I didn't know. But um, on the base of the Eiffel Tower, like, um, you know, kind of goes up to a point in the first, like, basically flat, I don't know, the horizontal. First platform. Platform, or whatever you want to call it. There's 72 um, French scientists, engineers, and mathematicians names, important people, basically, and their names are within the base of that. Um, and he's on like the north side, I think. And it's interesting, there's, um, and I wanted to call this out because I was reading about it and there were some people a little miffed about it because there's 72 names and not a single lady. Hmm. <laughs> no women. Sounds about right. And the reason <laughs> it was so notable <laughs> It's so ridiculous. So there was a French mathematician named Marie Sophie Germain, and her work is actually used in the construction of the tower. <laughs> that didn't include her. They didn't include her. <laughs> Which is so awful. Mm -hmm. um, she was actually one of the first people, the first women um, to attend actual lectures of the Academy of the Sciences. She was there. Like in, she wasn't the first woman to attend. The other women that would attend would be like, wives of the other scientists she was the first official woman scientist that would be a part of it but she literally took place in planning it and they left her off which i thought was such an injustice so marie i'm sorry but daguerre's there of for course. sure yeah. he's there of course yeah i mean you know it was a different time for ladies it's still it still is in a lot of respects which is kind of <laughs> sad <laughs> but yeah so his work insanely popular but yeah, yeah i think you know just doing all that research i really think william henry talbot you know we can't hit on all the processes like we said i mean we can try but there's a lot of them so we can oh, kind yeah. of hit on the important ones well the ones that kind of made you know importance and interesting or yeah. still being used but talbot for sure because you're going from you know the place were kind of they're expensive and you had to have a very specialized place to get them done um but Talbot's, you know, paper and the negatives itself, because everything up to that point was positive. So having yeah. negatives is so important. So I want to, I think that'll be our next one. Yeah. I didn't realize how significant daguerreotypes were. Yeah. I mean, that was like, that was a process that changed the world. It did. And it wasn't something that was just, um, I guess, because you could actually see an image of someone that you can recognize what it was that you were actually photographing at that point. Yeah. It made such a, such a significant impact and people wanted to, to replicate that and, and, you know, further the technology and the science behind it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, yeah. as where with, um, Nesiphore Neeps, he, you know, he discovered the, this, this process to begin with. And then the daguerreotype just, grew it that much further yeah so, and you know a honestly jump yeah daguerre being the hype man that he was like was probably a good thing <laughs> yeah <laughs> he absolutely. knew the right people to talk to he knew the right people to present this to 
you know, yeah. he, he got it out. He like he let people know exactly what this process was. Hey, look at this. Like he was the guy. I mean, you got to imagine this is a world before the Internet. Oh, <laughs> you yeah. know, this is like word of mouth was very important. <laughs> you know, you had written papers and things like that, but you had to really shout from the rooftops to get this stuff out. But I can't imagine. It's like the invention of the automobile. It's like oh, yeah. anything that's like, you know, people going to space like this is a big deal can you imagine a world without photography i mean that's not yeah I, you can't even picture it but it really it set off a lot of people and like hey <laughs> we can do this you know so people that weren't even thinking about capturing an image were like yeah. oh this is a thing and we can do it and i think the best part is that the image was so good yeah so good you look at those and they're just they're beautiful um, you have to look at daguerreotypes a little weird. You kind of have to look at them in a weird angle a little bit, yeah, um, to see them properly. But they're they're gorgeous. Yeah, they really are. Because they technically are a negative on the plate, right? Or is it a positive? They are. Yeah, they're kind of like um, yeah, similar to like a piece was like that too, where it was a positive, but not really. It was like so you have to have the it. light reflect in, in such a way that yeah, essentially the the reflective part would be the image. Um, that's in the emulsion mm -hmm. in, on the coating. Um, yeah. So you kind of have to like wiggle it a little bit and then get like the perfect view and then you kind of see it just right. So it's like kind of a negative, but not really. It's still a positive. Um, but yeah. I wonder if you could still get mercury vapor. Well, you can make, you can get mercury. You just have yeah. to heat it up to get the vapor. Yeah. But I don't think it's cheap. No, probably you can not. Just, they don't even make thermometers with mercury anymore. Yeah. Can you imagine that though? Making. Yeah. We got to up the safety in the lab. <laughs> yeah. No, from uh, people wanting to just go out and do this stuff. You need to have some serious safety precautions in order yeah. to work with any of this stuff. And if you do go for it, but be really, really careful. Yeah, definitely. You know, no pets. You got to have good ventilation, proper equipment. Research, research, research. I mean, I was looking over like the directions many, many, many times and I've still like not feel great about doing it myself. <laughs> I want to do a daguerreotype with flash powder. <laughs> I don't know if you Homemade gonna... <laughs> flash powder, make a daguerreotype. That that image, regardless of how well it came out, would be amazing. You just want all the danger in one one time. All the like danger. All the danger in one process. <laughs> yes. And then you make, somehow you make a print from that, and then you do a uh, mortar massage. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Even more. We'll just keep adding on the dangerous stuff. In yeah. There. And then we'll take a um, collodion picture of the Morton Sage. Yeah. <laughs> Let's keep going. With, with the ether. <laughs> the ether. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll definitely get into the, the collodion slash tintype slash. There's another name for that, too. Um, there's a few yeah. names for tintype. Amber type. type. Yeah, um, we'll get into that, too. Because that's also an amazing process. And that one is actually done way more often. You don't have a lot of daguerreotype studios for good reason. It's not just the process. You have to have every part of that process. Like I understand the biggest challenge with that is get, getting that plate polished. Because mm -hmm. you need that thing to be as smooth as possible. It needs to be reflective. Yep. And if it's not reflective enough, you end up with just, you know. Yeah. It just doesn't work right. Yep. Yeah, the, the, I was seeing some videos and people are literally using like buffers, like machine buffers like to Jeez. buff it out. Yeah, you can't like buff enough. It literally looks like a mirror. Like yeah. you have to buff that much. Jeez. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like a thing. So that's why you hear about like a lot of Tintuit type studios making their way back. But Daguerreotype, not so much. But, yeah. you know, practicality, it's a little easier to do a Tintype in regards to you know the actual process and the things that you have to do and i yeah. think safety slightly better yeah. it's still not the safest with the ether but you know you can still do it and not worry about dying mercury you gotta be careful repeat exposure yeah. and storage and yeah you know, it seems a bit dangerous stuff. yeah you're heating it up with you know a flame and <laughs> like it's... all the containers the contaminants mm -hmm. you usually get that onto something and then ingest it yeah and you got a lot of waste you know you don't want to be washing out anything with mercury out into the sewer system and yeah yeah there's just a lot you got to think about but yeah i mean it would be very cool to like try some of that stuff i'd love to yeah you know i think would be even funner um just let the danger be in someone else's hands go to someone that actually does it 
and yeah. knows what they're doing, witness it firsthand. Yeah. And then, you know, be like, okay, you do, you, you worked out all the details. I just want to see it firsthand. Cause I think that's, I mean, I don't necessarily have to do it. I just like to see someone doing it personally. Cause like yeah. you read it and it's sort of hard to work out exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're like, wait, okay. You kind of get it, but to see someone do it is a little different. There was a studio I I think it was in California somewhere um, that was doing tin, tin types, but also I think this particular studio was also doing the, um, the garotypes. Mm-hmm. So um, you can just go and get a, a daguerreotype made, which I think is, would be pretty rad. Yeah. We need to look that up. So definitely, uh, definitely on the list Christmas, of things Christmas to do. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to do that. Yeah. That'd be absolutely awesome. But yeah, I mean, what a, what a fun start to yeah. like, and I like that it was started sort of kind of by accident. I mean, I think he would have got there eventually. He was definitely trying to figure it out and working on it. Yeah. Um, but the fact that it was sort of an accidental thing that happened to yeah. make it happen is pretty cool. Yeah. And you know, to get paid for the rest of your life is kind of cool oh, as well. I know. Just get like a, yeah. He's like, ah, I got my income. I'm cool. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, I'm just going to go be Daguerre. <laughs> I wonder what would have happened if the government didn't pay him and he had to continue to like, you know, grow on that. Like what would, yeah. what would that be? Uh, yeah. I wonder if he would have done more himself or if he would have just kept just typing what he did more so than working on it. I don't know. There was just so many people like at that time that just started working on their own processes. I think he was pretty satisfied. I mean, he had spent years to get to that and he felt he probably maybe just felt really accomplished. I mean, sometimes if you get your goal, I mean, you don't necessarily have to keep going. I feel like if you invented photography, that's, you know, that's a good (laughs) A good sp- spot to, you know, be like, you know, I, I made something of myself. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, we, we're talking about him today. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So we can't. Right? I'm not going to fault the man. <laughs> for, <laughs> you did good. You did good to yep. care. You, yep. Thank you. <laughs> we appreciate everything that you've done. <laughs> yeah. No. Oh, awesome. Yeah. yeah. Daguerre type's cool. Um, we went over Neeps. Um, yeah. Oh, Neeps. I, now it's like. Who's next? Talbot? Talbot. Talbot, I think, is really important. So we'll do Talbot. Um, Yeah, it's weird. You want to go in like some sort of linear, you know, okay, this is the next one. This is the next one. Reality is that there was a lot of overlapping. A lot of different processes were using parts of processes and doing new processes. But the timeline really starts kind of just overlapping all over the place at this point. So there's no real straight line from this point. Um, so yeah, we'll definitely we'll hit some the big players. You yeah. know, we'll hit like um, cyanotype, collodion for sure, Talbot yeah. with the the paper, um, Eastman, you know, yeah, with Kodak because that was like an important piece of that, and yeah. I, th- I think he was a bit of a weird guy, um, the good and the bad. I think that was the major jump. I mean, he's kind of noted as the first person with photography in the u.s at least that's my understanding yeah when i think of the oldest well person to bring it to the masses yeah 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 to Out, commercialize outside of having like to go to like the studio yeah and getting you know the formal portrait done by a, a photographer but, you can now do this in your own home and he yeah. was the guy that brought it to everybody so that's obviously a very very important um part of the process as well yeah um, but yeah we can i think maybe and go into a little bit of you know all those crazy processes <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> maybe touch upon all of those yeah we can um, do that because mm. there is so many of them so yeah we can get into those a little bit and just have a, a whole podcast just about process and yeah. like all the ones that exist out there and i'm sure there's many 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 more that have never been actually documented for whatever reason yeah at least five <laughs> <laughs> it's at least five there's probably some dude that had like some amazing process and he blew himself up in the process or killed himself in the process and no one yeah. knew <laughs> positive yep. that had happened he did some, or that or he did something different and like you know something minor and yeah. died because of it mm-hmm. but yeah it's just kind of amazing i mean it's all it's sure there's all a science. da vinci out there that you know had all the yeah. stuff and it burnt up in a fire or exactly something. exactly there's always like amazing people that just get you know the they unsung. don't get credit <laughs> they don't get the credit which is so sad but that's okay i mean yeah. everybody's doing their own thing but yeah, so we'll definitely, um, you'll hear Talbot 
on the next podcast for sure. I'll do yeah. some digging. I feel like I'm back in school. I've been <laughs> yep. tasking Stacy with all the research. <laughs> I've been gladly doing it though. I've been gladly like looking this up because it's like I hear all these names and I, I've definitely heard heard bits and pieces. So it's always fun to kind of do deep dives. Um, it's interesting too when you go to do a deep dive. You're like, oh, this should be like you know pretty straightforward. You know, hey, maybe Wikipedia. But it is not the case. I've been deep diving. It's like this combination of like, you know, books that are scanned and articles that are scanned from other things. And everybody has like bits and pieces of a little bit of everything. And then you got to kind of all put it together. So it's not as straightforward. I actually spent quite a few hours (laughs) digging all the research up. Oh, yeah. Um, But it's fun. It's it's really interesting to go through. But I do feel like I'm in school again. I'm not getting a grade, thank God. But I'm grading you. You grade? Are you grading me? Am I getting a grade? Don't like ask me to show my notes. I'm not like keeping my actual. um, I'm not keeping proper uh, documentation. I'm like not citing any sources. I'll I'll pass you. (laughs) Okay, I get a pad. Pass fail. I work. That's perfect. 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 Um, But if anybody is at home and they ever hear me talk about any of this, like, hey, that's not right or whatever, fight me. No, you can. You can. You can call me out and tell me. Yes. If I've gotten any of these facts wrong, please correct us. Yeah, I'm trying my best to like double check on everything. So anytime I like hear something, I'll go try to find another source and make sure that actually makes sense. Um, before I throw it out to you guys, but if you know something glaring that I'm telling you, and you're like, that is not right, <laughs> just let me know. Yeah. That or we can fight by the dumpsters out back below. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a few events coming up. We very do. Quick. Yeah. So this podcast comes out on, on Tuesday, October 3rd. 3rd. So shortly after, on Saturday, we have the witchcraft market, mm. which is very exciting because it's October. Yep, so it's spooky, Saturday, it's October seventh. Yeah, witchcraft market. That's it's gonna, gonna be, be a in, lot of fun in Glendale at Glendale Civic Center. Yep, come on out if you like spooky stuff. If even if you're not like, you don't have to be a witch or a warlock to come to this. <laughs> to make that clear, um, it's really very October, fall, Halloween, witchcraft, spooky. It's just a catch-all. Um, for what you're going to find there and just amazing vendors a lot of people making some amazing things and creators and we're lucky enough to yeah. go and be able to take photos because i suspect people will be wearing some very beautiful october witchy type of clothes so mm. stacy is adding pumpkin spice to all of the portraits that she <laughs> processes <laughs> <laughs> just a sprinkle of pumpkin spice we'll just pour a little on that'll be like yep. part of the fixer so you get a little extra yep. october in there you mm. get your pumpkin spice fix now but with pumpkin spice. Now with pumpkin spice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's a little something something to the photo. But yeah, that's, Dan's going to be gothed out. Yeah, that'll be fun. Very, um, very exciting about I'm gonna that. I'm going to put eyeliner on. I know, but he's going to sweat it off. Because Dan, if you know yeah, Dan, I sweat. Dan mm-hmm. is a sweaty boy. And we'll be outside. Although the weather's supposed to be under 100. So for Arizona, that ain't bad. <laughs> yeah, that'll be I'm, fun. I'm hoping as low as it can go. And we're in a shady spot as possible i'm hoping but dan will be running the islander which honestly i feel like it's a little bit more goth yep like you're crying all black clothes Gotta some get wristbands some. yeah you're gonna look pretty good i'm yep. excited about it so, but we'll yeah. be able to take some photos and we haven't done that for a little while the um last time we did was terror trader and that was yeah. how long ago is that now it was august all end right. of august yeah, so it was a few months, so it's nice to be back in the saddle again. And we have so many events coming up. Um, we won't bore you with every single one of our events, but the main ones, especially this month, um, we have that witchcraft market. And then on the 13th, which yeah. is Friday the 13th, which is so appropriate for October. October. I yeah. know, so good. Um, Phoenix Forge yeah. is having an open house, which is really cool. And if you're not familiar with Phoenix Forge, you can look them up. They're a makerspace in um, Phoenix. They're on Van Buren. They're really close if you, the venue, the Van Buren, like they're not too far from that. They're actually in the same block there um, as the Van Buren, kind of between the Van Buren and the McDonald's. You could do woodworking, metal shop, Mm -hmm. 3D prototyping, 3D printing. Yep. Um, They're expanding. They have a jewelry section in there, sewing section. jewelry, electronics. I saw a screen printing thing in there. I don't think they've officially started that, but I definitely saw one. Yeah. Um, They're really doing amazing things. They haven't been there that long at all they're actually open to the public but they're through the university system um so i think discounted for students and faculty and things i think yeah. um that they have for that for their programs but they do different classes and they have open hours for all of what they do yep. um, but they asked us to come 
for their Halloween event, which yeah. I think it's like the Halloween hoedown. Is yeah, that right? Halloween hoedown. Halloween hoedown. So they're doing kind of like a cowboy theme, but it, it, take a look at their page. Um, keep an on their updates. I forget the times of that, but it's definitely Friday the 13th in the I believe evening. It's 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. on Friday the 13th. Yeah, something like that's in the the evening there and then they're gonna allow people to actually go to different stations all around the the space and yeah. make things and do stuff and do some little experimenting and little projects and stuff and it's a free event but it's if you're looking for somewhere to like do woodworking or metalworking or 3d printing or any of that stuff and you don't have the room or the resources this is definitely a place you want to look into because their facility is beautiful oh yeah they have really nice location there like oh, i didn't okay. realize how big it was like i saw it in the corner and i knew they were fairly big then we went in the building i'm like oh wow <laughs> like, you yeah. guys have a lot of space in here so we did we partnered up with them they asked us if we could come and take photos of the event but also because you know a lot of the people kind of cross over yeah know, makers good, and analog photography kind of mix well or well so. we get a nerd out with the other nerds yes yeah, it's exactly <laughs> 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 we're gonna get nerdy with it but um yeah. that's a fun event so definitely follow those folks um really nice um what's his name i forget your name lucas oh, I'm lucas i'm sorry i forgot your name um lucas super super nice and he's kind of the guy that's getting the word out about the space to everybody yeah. but they haven't been around super long but yeah super great and our other event I'm going to hype PFR Creative Club. Yep. I'm going to do it. So that's on that following after Phoenix um, Forge when we do that, the Wednesday the 18th. So if you don't already follow um, PFR Creative Club on Instagram, we're um, Creative Club. I think we talked about it before on the podcast, but we're a free group um, of people that just want to come and hang and do crafts and just general art stuff. Yep. Um, for an evening once a month and we just get together and kind of shoot the bullshit and make crafts and there's no grading there's no pressure it's just literally just people just hanging out um and then on the 18th we're doing a um sculpture night so we're bringing in like fimo sculpey type clay which is clay that you make and then you heat up like to like 275 or whatever and then hardens up and we'll make some stuff with air clay clay as well and we have some examples um you can check out our Instagram and see some of the examples of stuff. So we can guide you if you've never done any kind of clay stuff. You don't have to have any experience with any of this. It's really having fun. But it'll be kind of fun for, you know, Halloween coming. I made some yeah. uh, body part stuff. <laughs> I made some lower <laughs> intestines and <laughs> a stomach and yeah. a few things out of clay. And then Tanisa made a, a ghost and little pumpkin out of the air clay, which looks really cute. <laughs> um, but if you have experience, you can come. If you don't have experience, you can come. But we just ask you RSVP just so we know. Kind of give or take yep. how many people are showing up for our event. Um, but that's Wednesday the 18th. Yep. So that's cool. Yep. Wednesday the 18th. Wednesday the 18th, yeah. Be there, be square. I know. And then our next podcast that will be coming out um, before the one with Talbot. So after this one comes out, the one the next Tuesday after this yep. will be... Um, with Liz Potter. Liz Potter. Yeah. Very exciting. If you don't follow Liz Potter online, go online right now. Go to Instagram, put in Liz Potter, and follow Liz. Because Liz yes. is amazing. And we'll definitely put out a post questions for um, Liz. So if you want to ask her something that we, you want us to get to her. Um, oh, no. Sorry. We already recorded it. I too take, late. I totally take that back. <laughs> I was going to say we're going to record it. We already recorded it. So it's too late. Yeah. I think we already did ask people that. We'll have future podcasts. You future podcasts. Questions. Yes. If we have people coming up, we'll actually ask you to ask them questions. Um but anyway, that's a really good podcast. She was super duper nice. We actually recorded that a little while ago. We shuffle. We do our podcast yep. and then we kind of shuffle them a little bit. Back in on. July, I think we recorded with her. Yeah. Yeah. It was a little while ago, but that happens because some people have events and other things and we kind of shuffle everybody as we record them. So we actually have enough podcasts to go out almost to the end of the year. So we have some exciting people um, that we're going to have on in the future. We have some local people, which is really cool. Danny Upshaw said thank you, or not thank you, but <laughs> thank you to Danny Upshaw yeah. for saying yes, because we asked him if he'd like to uh, be on our podcast. He doesn't actually do film, but if you're in Phoenix and you're a photographer, you probably know Danny Upshaw's name. <laughs> so yeah. he's an important guy. He's like constantly, constantly busy and working and just really important and really kind of a amazing, fun guy and Yep. really accepting and really supportive of the photography community here in Phoenix. So super important. So we'll have him on here some point toward the end of the year, probably, but yep. it's excited to have another local person. I always like the local podcast. Yep. 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 But, but uh, we got lots more podcasts on the way. Mm -hmm. um, we'll be, 
connecting with more people and uh, we have some own of our own projects as well that we'll be working on as uh as well i know we're trying our best to actually get out there and (laughs) I know it's, the the nice thing is it's cooling down now, so it we can is. finally get outside and go have fun. So yeah, we we're sitting here today with all of our windows open, which is so nice to do because yes. we couldn't even do that before because our previously the the windows were just redone in the house and there was no screens, so even when the weather was good there we couldn't. So they got redone and we were right at the beginning of summer. So we never yeah. really got to open up the house. So I was like, oh, man, we have these screens. We want to use them. <laughs> so now the weather, like, soon as, I mean, it's still, like, probably 90 some degrees outside. But in Arizona terms, that feels kind of nice. And, like, so all the windows are open and we just have the air just flowing through here today. Which nice is, little warm breeze coming in the windows. It's just lovely. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So thank you guys again for joining us for another podcast. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. We appreciate you guys. Um and then you know we always have classes so if you want to dig in a little further into photography and film stuff that you maybe haven't done check our schedule out yep we also have a patreon we like to promote we do (laughs) just because like this does cost us money (laughs) so we appreciate anyone that can throw us any kind of money um to help this go yep so it's going to be patreon.com forward slash phx film revival And uh, thank you guys again for listening to another episode. Thank you. Thank you so much. Catch you on the next. Bye, guys. Bye.